Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Episode 1. Hold your noise. Keep still, you little devil. I'll cut your throat. Pray don't do it, sir. Tell us your name. Quick. Sir. Once more. Give it mouth. Sir. Show us where you live. Point down the place. Ours was the marsh country. I managed to point out our village a mile away before the church in front of me went head over heels and he emptied my pockets. I had nothing in them but a piece of bread. You young dog. What fat cheeks you got. Damn me if I couldn't eat them. Oh. You sit on that stone. It takes you move. Where's your mother? There, sir. And is that your father along of her? Yes, sir. In this parish, sir. Who do you live with? Supposing you're kindly let to live? My sister, sir. Mrs. Joe Gasherick. She's married to Joe Gasherick, sir. The blacksmith, sir. Blacksmith? You know what a fire is? Yes, sir. And you know what whittles is? Yes, sir. You get me a file, and you get me whittles. You bring them here to me, or I'll have your heart and liver right. Here. Keep me up, right, sir. You bring a lot to me tomorrow morning at that old battery over there. You do it, and you never dare to say a word concerning you having seen such a person as me, and you shall be let to live. Now, I ain't alone, as you may think. There's a man hid with me in comparison with which I am an angel. He can hear us. It is in vain for a boy to try and hide himself from that man. A boy may lock his door, be warm in bed, think himself safe, but that man will creep and creep his way to him and cut him open. Now, what do you say? I'll get them, sir, and I'll come, sir. Say, Lord, strike you dead if you don't. The Lord, strike me dead if I don't, sir. Now, remember what you undertook. And you remember that man? And you get home? G- good night, sir. It ain't that. I was out of rock. Or a heel. Remember? When at last I looked back, On the edge of the river, I could only make out two black upright things, a beacon which sailors steered by, and a gibbet with chains where a pirate had been hanged. The man was limping towards this. I looked all around for the horrible man, but I could see no signs of him. Mrs. Joel's been out a dozen times looking for you, Pip. Is she still? Aye, and what's worse, she's got Tickler with her. Tickler was a wax-ended cane worn smooth by collision with my tickled frame. My sister, not a good-looking woman, was more than 20 years older than I and had established a great reputation with herself and her neighbours because she had brought me up by hand. Joe, with his yellow curls and sweet temper, I always suppose she had married by hand. She got down, she got up, she makes a grab at Tickler, and she rampaged out. She's coming. Get behind me, leg. Now, where you been, you young monkey? And tell me directly what you've been doing to wear me away with fret and fright and worry, or I'll have you out of that corner if you was 50 peps. No. And he was 500 gorgeries. Churchyard. If it wasn't for me, you'd have been in the churchyard long ago. Who brought you up by end? You did. And why did I do it, I should like to know? I don't know. Churchyard. 
You may well say churchyard, you two. You'll drive me there between you one of these days. Come on, eat. My sister had a trenchant way of cutting our bread and butter. First, she jammed the loaf hard against her bib, where it sometimes got a pin in it or a needle, which we afterwards got in our mouths. Then she took not too much butter and spread it as if she were making a plaster with a slapping dexterity. She then sawed a very thick round off the top, hewed it into two halves, Joe getting one and I the other. Though I was hungry, I dared not eat my slice. I felt I must have something in reserve for my dreadful acquaintance and the still more dreadful man. Knowing Mrs. Joe's housekeeping to be of the strictest kind, I slid my hunk of bread and butter down my trouser leg. Pip, old chap. What's the matter now? Well, I say, you know, you do yourself a mischief. It'll stick somewhere. You can't have chored it, Pip. What's the matter? If you can cough any trifle on it up, Pip, I recommend you do it. Manners is manners, but still you're else, you're else. By this time, my sister was quite desperate, so she pounced on Joe, and taking him by his two whiskers, knocked his head for a little while against the wall above my head. Oh, no, perhaps you'll mention what's the matter, you staring great stuck peg. You know, Pip, you and me's all as friends, and I'll be the last to tell upon you any time. But such a most uncommon bolt as that. Ben Bolton his food, has it? You know, old chap, I bolted myself when I was your age, frequent. And as a boy, I'd been among as many bolters, but I never seen your bolting equal yet, Pep. It's a mercy you ain't bolted dead. You come along and be dosed. A pint of tar water, the urgency of my case deemed to demand it, was poured down my throat while Mrs. Joe held my head under her arm as a boot would be held by a boot jack. Joe got off with only half a pint. Because you've had a turn. Uh. <laughs> the guilty knowledge that I was going to rob Mrs. Joe. I never thought I was going to rob Joe. United to the need for always keeping one hand on my bread and butter almost drove me out of my mind. Then, as the marsh winds made the fire glow and flame. Now, remember what you've undertook. And you remember that man? As it was Christmas Eve, I had to stir the pudding for next day with a copper stick from seven to eight by the Dutch clock and found the tendency of exercise to bring the bread and butter out at my ankle quite unmanageable until finally I could slip away and deposit that part of my conscience in my garret bedroom. Joe? Cannon, Pip. There's another corn whipped off. What does that mean, Joe? Escaped! Escaped! What's a convict? A bad man. There was a corn whipped off last night after sunset gun and they fired warning of him. And now it appears they're firing warning of another. Who's firing? <gasps> Drat the boy! Ask no questions, you'll be told no lies. Ask her. Mrs. Joe, I should like to know, if you wouldn't much mind, where the guns come from? The ox. And please, what's hope? That, that's the way with this boy. Answer him one question, he'll ask you a dozen directly. Hulks are prison ships, right across the marshes. Who's putting them? I didn't bring you up by hand to badger people's lives out. It'd be blamed to me, not praise. People are put in the ox because they murder and because they rob and forge and do all sorts of bad. And they always begin by asking questions. Now get you along to bed. Since that time, which is far enough away now, I've often thought that few people know what secrecy there is in the young under terror, no matter how unreasonable the terror, so that it be terror. If I slept at all that night, it was only to imagine myself drifting down the river to the hulks, and the ghostly pirate calling out to me through a speaking trumpet as I passed the gibbet that I'd better come ashore and be hanged there and then, for I knew, at the first faint dawn of morning, I must rob the pantry. Every board on the way down cried, Stop, thief! Get up, Mrs. Joe! From the pantry, which was far more abundantly supplied than usual, it being Christmas, I stole some bread, 
some rind of cheese, about half a jar of mincemeat, some brandy from a stone bottle, a meat bone with very little on it, and a beautiful, round, compact pork pie. It had been so carefully covered in a corner that I took it, hoping it was not intended for early use and would not be missed for some time. In the forge, I got a file from among Joe's tools, put up the fastenings as I'd found them, and ran for the misty, damp marshes. The mist was so heavy that instead of my running at everything, everything seemed to run at me. Looming shapes, very frightening to a guilty mind. One black ox with a white cravat on stung my conscience like a priest. I couldn't help it, sir. It wasn't for myself I took it. Before pulling down his head, blowing a cloud of smoke out of his nose and vanishing with a kick up of his hind legs and a flourish of his tail. I knew I was very near to the battery when I saw the man. His back was towards me, heavy with sleep, so I touched his shoulder. It was the bad man. Then, at the battery, there was the right man, hugging himself and limping as if he'd never all night left off hugging and limping, waiting for me. He was awfully cold. I half expected to see him drop down before my face and die of deadly cold. Oh, what's in the bottle, boy? B Brandy. <laughs> I think you've got fever, sir. <laughs> I might have your opinion, boy. <laughs> you've been lying out on the meshes. I'll eat my fill before the shivers of the death of me. I'd do that if I was going to be strung up to that there gallows directly afterwards. I'll bet you. I'd often watched a large dog of ours. The man ate the same way, strong, sharp, sudden bites, snapping up every mouthful. You're not a deceiving imp. You brought no one with you. No, sir. No, oh. no. Oh. Mm. Well, I believe you. This is goodbye. I'm glad you like it. Thank you, my boy. I do. Won't you leave any of it for him? Who's him? The bad man that was with you. Oh, uh, he don't want no whittles. Uh, I thought he looked like he did. No. When? Just now. Where? Over there. He was sleeping. I, I thought he was you. Tell me! D dressed like you, or only with a hat. Didn't you hear the cannon last night? And there was firing. We heard it up at home, and that's where the... Why, oh, see now. When a man's alive, on these flats, with a light head and a tight stomach perishing... He hears nothing all night but guns firing and voices calling and sees red coats, torches. This man! Did you notice anything on him? His face was hurt. Here? Yes. Where is he? Where is he? Show me the way he went. I'll put him down like a dog. Curse his iron on my leg. Give us hold of the fire, boy. And he was down on the wet grass, filing at his iron like a madman not minding me or his own leg, which had an old chafe and was bloody, but which he handled as roughly as if it had no more feeling in it than the file. I, I must go. He took no notice, so I slipped away. The last I heard of him as I stopped in the wind to listen was the file still going. Joe and I going to Christmas church must have been a moving spectacle for compassionate minds. In his working clothes, Joe was a well-knit, characteristic-looking blacksmith. In his holiday clothes, he was more like a scarecrow in good circumstances. When I was taken to have a new suit of clothes, the tailor had orders from my sister to make them more like a reformatory and on no account to let me have free use of my limbs. Yet what I suffered outside was nothing to what I underwent within the terror whenever Mrs. Joe went anywhere near the pantry. And under the weight of my wicked secret, I pondered whether the church would be powerful enough to shield me from the vengeance of the terrible man. 
Yet half past one arrived, the Christmas dinner hour, and still not a word of the robbery. I must still suffer. Open the front door. It was never at any other time. And I opened it to Mr. Wopsle, the clerk of the church, Mr. Hubble, the wheelwright, and Mrs. Hubble, and Joe's Uncle Pumblechook, a well-to-do corn chandler who drove his own chaise cart. Mrs. Joe, I have bought you as a compliment to the season. I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of sherry wine, and I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of port wine. Every Christmas, as a profound novelty, he presented himself with exactly the same words and bottles, and every Christmas... Oh, Uncle Pumblechook, this is kind. It's no more than your merits. And I was six pennies of halfpenny. Let us eat. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Do you hear that? Be grateful. Especially be grateful, boy, to them which brought you up by hand. The young are never grateful because they are naturally wishes. At times like those, Joe always aided and comforted me when he could in some way of his own. There being plenty of gravy today, Joe spooned into my plate about half a pint. I consider the topic of today's sermon ill-chosen. You've hit it, sir. Plenty of subjects going about for them that know how to put salt on the tail. <laughs> look at pork alone. If you want a subject, look at pork. True, sir. Many are moral for the young. You listen to this. Swine! Pointing his fork at my blushes, as if he were mentioning my Christian name. Were the companions of the prodigal, the gluttony of swine... He is put before us as an example to the young. What is detestable in a pig is more detestable in a boy. Or a girl? Oh, of course, of a girl, Mr. Hubble. But there is no girl present. Besides, young sixpence, think what you've got to be grateful for if you'd been born a squeaker. He was. If ever a child was. You would have been disposed of for as many shillings according to the market price of the article. A dunstable, a butcher, would have come up to you as you lay in your straw and he would have whipped you under his left arm. And with his right, he would have tucked up his frock to get a penknife from out of his waistcoat pocket and he would shed your blood and had your life. Mm-hmm. No bringing up my hand then. Oh, not a bit of it. Joe offered me more gravy, which I was afraid to take. It was a world of trouble to you, ma'am. Trouble? Trouble? Clean plates. Cold, Mr. Gargery. Ladies and gentlemen, you must taste to finish with such a delightful and delicious present of Uncle Pumblechook. Oh. <laughs> a savoury pork pie. Well, oh. Mrs. Shaw, we'll do our best endeavours. <laughs> Let's have a cut. You shall have some. Huh? Uh, a bit of savoury pork pie would lay atop of anything you could mention and do no harm. No harm. Oh! Oh! I've never been absolutely sure whether I uttered a shrill yell of terror merely in spirit or in the bodily hearing of the company, but I knew I must run away. I released the leg of the table I'd been gripping and ran for my life, straight into soldiers. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on a chase in the name of the king. He was chasing me. He was holding out the handcuffs. And I want the blacksmith. And pray, what might you want with him? Mrs. Speaking for myself, I should reply the honour and pleasure is from worse acquaintance. Speaking for the king, I answer, a little job done. Uh, we've had an accident with these cuffs. I find the lock of one of them goes wrong and the coupling don't act pretty. As they're waiting for immediate service, will you throw your eye over them? It'll take two hours. Then will you get about it at once, blacksmith? It's on his majesty's business. Here, you two, make yourselves useful to the blacksmith. Chris, stand easy. How far might you call yourselves from the marshes hereabouts? Well, j- just a mile, sergeant. Oh, that'll do. We'll begin to close in on them about dusk. A little before dusk, my orders are. Yes, yeah, that'll do. Uh, convicts, Sergeant? Two. They're pretty well known to be out on the marshes still, and they won't try to get clear of them before dusk. Uh, anybody here seen any such game? No. Oh. Well, they'll find themselves trapped in a circle sooner than they can count on.
beer for the soldiers. And you, Sergeant, would you partake of a glass of... He wine? shall have the wine, Mum. Ah, his Majesty's health. His Majesty's health. And the compliments of the season. <laughs> oh, good stuff, eh, Sergeant? Oh, I'll tell you something. I suspect that stuff's of your providing. Uh, uh, why? Because you're a man that knows what's what. <laughs> oh, do you think so? Um, have another glass. Oh, and you, Sixpence? <laughs> it seemed to me Uncle Pumblechook had forgotten he'd given the bottle as a present. Oh, your health, sir. May you live a thousand years and never be a worse judge of the right sort than you are at the present moment of your life. <laughs> With you, Ob and Nob, the top of mine to the foot of yours, the foot of yours to the top of mine. Ring once, ring twice. Ah, the best tune on musical glasses. <laughs> oh, no, no, Sergeant. <clears throat> Thank you, Blacksmith. <clears throat> Men! Shall we go over the soldiers and see what comes of the arm? No, uh, I think not. No, 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 not me. I will, if you do, too. Aye. Uh, oh, and I'll take Pip, Mrs. Joe. If you bring the boy back with his head blown to bits by a musket, don't look to me to put it together again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ladies, thank you. Oh, thank uh, you, Sergeant. Sir. Sergeant. Oh, hey, Blacksmith, oh, if you're coming, keep well to the rear of the men and speak no word after we reach the marshes. Men, master. On the marshes, footing was bad, darkness descending, and a bitter sleet came rattling against us on the east wind, and Joe took me on his back. Well, I hope you they shan't find them. <laughs> I'd give a shilling because they'd cut and run, Pet. <laughs> the soldiers were in front of us, extending into a pretty wide line with an interval between man and man. <laughs> Under the low red glare of sunset, the beacon and the gibbet and the mound of the battery and the opposite shore of the river were plain, though all of a watery lead colour. With my heart thumping like a blacksmith at Joe's broad shoulder, I looked all about for any sign of the convicts. I could see none. I could only hear Mr. Wopsle. Don't tumble. Try to keep up, Mr. Wopsle. The soldiers were moving on in the direction of the old battery. Make to the first shout! At the double! We slanted away to the right, and Joe pounded away so wonderfully I had to hold on tight to keep my seat. Hold on, Pat! Hold on! A real winder, Pat! Down banks and up banks and over gates and splashing into dikes and breaking among coarse rushes, no man cared where he went. Surrender, you two! My convict and the other man, bleeding and bruised all over, were dragged out. My convict shook torn hair from his fingers. I... I took him. I'll give it up to you. Like that. There's not much to be particular about. It'll do you small good, my man, being in the same plight yourself. Hey, handcuffs! I don't expect it to do me any good. I don't want it to do me more good than it does not. <laughs> I took him. <laughs> he knows it. That's enough of me. Take notice, God. He tried to murder me. Yeah. Tried. Tried and not do it. I not only prevented him getting off the marshes, but I dragged him back here. He's a gentleman, if you please, this villain. Now the hunks has got his gentleman again. Me. He tried to murder me! I should have been a dead man if you'd not come up! Look at my leg! You won't find much iron on it. 
I could have got clear of these flats. If I hadn't made the discovery he was here, let him go free! Let him make a tool of me afresh! Try again. to murder me! He lies! Let him tell his eyes are his on me! I defy him to do it! You see those groveling and wandering eyes? That's how he looked when we was tried together. They never looked at me. You're not much to look at! <laughs> Did I tell you? <laughs> Enough! Light the torches. As I alighted from Joe's back, my convict saw me. I shook my head to try and assure him of my innocence. I don't know if he understood, but he gave me an attentive look. I didn't understand. Then he turned away. All right. March! Uh, you're expected on board. I wish to say something respecting my escape. You have no call to say it here. I know. But a man can't starve, at least I can't. I took some whittles up in the village, where the church stands almost out on the marshes. You mean stole? From the blacksmiths. <laughs> there were some broken whittles. That's what it was. And a dram of liquor and a pie. Have you happened to miss such an article as a pie, blacksmith? My wife did at the very moment when you come in. Don't you know, Pep? So you're the blacksmith. I'm sorry to say... I've eaten your pie. God knows you're welcome to it so far as it was ever mine. We don't know what you have done, but we wouldn't have you starved to death for it, poor miserable fellow creature. What is Pep? He turned his back, and we saw him put in a boat rowed by a crew of convicts like himself. By the light of the torches, we saw the black hulk lying out a little way from the mud of the shore. Moored by massive rusty chains, it seemed in my young eyes to be ironed like the prisoners. I saw him taken up the side and disappear. And then the ends of the torches were flung hissing into the water and went out as if it were all over with him. Mr. Wopsle's great aunt kept an evening school in her little general shop. She was a ridiculous old woman of limited means and unlimited infirmity who used to go to sleep from six to seven every evening in the society of youths who paid tuppence each per week for the improving opportunity of seeing her do so. Mr. Wopsle read poetry aloud upstairs. The shop was run by Mr. Wopsle's great aunt's granddaughter, Biddy, an orphan like myself. And with Biddy's help, I struggled through the alphabet as if it had been a bramble bush, getting considerably worried and scratched by every letter. But by a year after the hunt on the marsh, I had begun to read, write and cipher on the very smallest scale. Pip, what are you writing on that slate? It's for you. A letter. I say, Pip, old chap. What a scholar you are, ain't you? I should like to be. The writing's rather hilly. Well, here's a J and an O equal to anything. And a J and a O. And a J O. Joe! Well. Read the rest, Joe. The rest, eh, Pip? It says, My dear Joe, I hope you are quite well. I hope I shall soon be able for to teach you, Joe, and then we shall be so glad and... When I am apprentice to you, Joe, what larks and believe me, affection, Pip. How would you spell gargery, Joe? I don't spell it at all. But suppose you did? It can't be supposed. 
When you were as little as me, did you go to school? No, Pip. My father, Pip, were given a drink. And when he were overtook with drink, he hammered away at me mother. And then he hammered at me with a wigger only to be equalled by the wigger with which he didn't hammer at his anvil. You're a listening and understanding, Pip? Yes, Joe. Consequence, me mother and me, we ran away a lot and she put me to school. But me father were that good in his heart that he couldn't bear to be without us. And so he'd come with a most tremendous crowd and make such a row at the doors of the houses where we was that they used to be obligated to have no more to do with us and to give us up to him. And then he took us home and he hammered us, which, you see, Pip were a drawback on me learning. Poor Joe. Well, somebody had to keep the pot a-boiling. Consequence, me father didn't make objections to me going to work in the forge. In time, I were able to keep him, and I kept him, until he went off in a purple leptic fit. Mother were in poor health and quite broke. She weren't long a following, poor soul. Her share of peace come round at last. It were but lonesome then, living here alone, till I got acquainted with your sister, and whatever the family opinions and whatever the world's opinions on that subject may be, Pip, your sister is a fine figure of a woman. Yes, Joe. A little redness or a little matter of bone here or there was a signify to me. When I got acquainted with your sister, it was a talk of how she was bringing you up by hand, a very kind of her too, and I said along with all the folks. So when we was to be married, I said to her, and bring the poor little child, there's room for him at the forge. <laughs> Ever the best of friends, and there's Pip. Don't cry, old chap. Come on, old chap. Now, when you take me in hand in my learning, Pip, and I tell you beforehand, I am awful dull, most awful dull, Mrs. Joe mustn't see what we're up to. And why on the sly? I'll tell you, Pip. Your sister is given to government. Government? Which I mean to say, the government of you and myself. Oh. And she ain't over partial to having scholars on the premises for fear as I might rise, like a sort of rebel, don't you see? Why don't you... Why don't I rise? Yes. Well, I want to say this very serious to you, old chap. I see so much in my mother of a woman drudging and starving and breaking her honest heart and never getting no peace in her mortal days... But I'm dead afeard of going wrong in the way of not doing what's right by a woman. And I'd fur rather of the two go wrong to other way and be a little ill convenience myself. I wish it was only me that got put out, Pip. I wish there weren't no tickler for you, old chap. I wish I could take it all on myself, but this is the up and down and straight on it, Pip. And I hope you'll overlook shortcomings. Young as I was, I believe I dated a new admiration for Joe from that night. I had the sensation of us being equals, of feeling conscious that I was looking up to him in my heart. Here's eight of them, and she's not come home yet. I hope Uncle Pumblechook's mare mayn't have set four foot on a piece of ice and gone down. Mrs. Joe made occasional trips with Uncle Pumblechook on market days to help him in buying such household stuffs and goods as required a woman's judgment, Uncle Pumblechook being a bachelor. Joe made the fire and swept the hearth, and we worried. Joe was right. It was a dry, cold night, and the frost was white and hard. A man would die tonight of lying out on the marshes, I thought. How awful it would be for a man to turn his face up to the stars as he froze to death and see no help or pity in all the glittering multitude. Here comes the mare, ringing like a peal of bells. Oh, the fire, the fire. Come close, Uncle Pumblechook. Oh, Mother, yes. Oh, no. If the boy ain't grateful this night, he never will be. It's only to be hoped he won't be palm paint. But I have my fear. Oh, she ain't like that, Mum. She knows better. She? Well, what are you staring at? It were mentioned she. 
And she is a she, I suppose. Unless you call Miss Eversham a he, and I doubt if even you go so far as that. Miss Eversham uptown? Is there a Miss Eversham downtown? She wants this boy to go and play there, and of course he's going. And he'd better play there. Or I'll work him. Everybody for miles round had heard of Miss Havisham Uptown as an immensely rich and grim lady who lived all alone. Well, I wonder how she knew you, Pip. No, though, who said she knew him? And couldn't she ask Uncle Pumblechook if he knew of a boy? Isn't it just barely possible that Uncle Pumblechook may be a tenant of hers and sometimes goes there to pay his rent? And couldn't she ask Uncle Pumblechook then? And Uncle Pumblechook being always considerate and thoughtful for us, though you may not think it, Joseph, then mentions this boy that I have ever been a willing slave to. Well put. Now, Joseph, you know the case. No, Joseph, you may consider that you do, but you do not. You do not know that Uncle Pumblechook, being sensible that this boy's future may be made by his going to Miss Havisham's, has offered in his own chaise cart to take him into town tonight and to take him with his own hands to Miss Havisham's tomorrow morning. Oh, Lord, mercy me, here I am talking to mere moon calves with Uncle Bumblejoo waiting and the mare catching cold at the door and the boy grimed with crock and dirt from the hair of his head to the sole of his foot. I was then soaked and kneaded, toweled, thumped, harrowed and rasped until I was quite beside myself, then put into clean linen of the stiffest character and trussed up in my tightest, fearfullest suit. There! Fit to go, Uncle Bumblejoo. Boy! Be ever grateful to all friends, but especially with them which brought you up a hand. I had never parted from Joe before, and what with my feelings and the soap suds, I could at first see no stars from the cart. But gradually they twinkled out one by one, without throwing any light on the question why on earth I was going to play at Miss Havisham's and what on earth I was expected to play at. Another running sum. Seven and four. Eleven. And eight. Oh, don't lag, boy. No, I don't know. Nineteen and six. Oh, Twenty-five and two. Twenty-seven. And ten. Smelling of flower seeds, bulbs and peppercorn, Uncle Pumblechook's conversation consisted of nothing but arithmetic, all the way from his shop to Miss Havisham's house. It was of old brick, dismal, and had a great many iron bars in it. Some of the windows had been walled up, and there was a courtyard in front, which was barred too. And fourteen. Oh, can't you hear, boy? What name? Mr. Pumblechook. Quite right. Plus seven. Ah, this is Pip. The young lady was very pretty and looked very proud. Come in, Pip. In we go. Did you wish to see Miss Havisham? If Miss Havisham wished to see me, I'd... But you see, she don't. Boy, let your behaviour here be a credit unto them which brought you up by hand. All was empty and disused, and beyond the courtyard loomed a large brewery. You could drink without hurt all the strong beer that's brewed there now, boy. Yes, miss. Not that anybody means to try. As to strong beer, there's enough bit in the cellars already to drown the manor house. Is that the name of this house, miss? One of them, boy. The other one was Satis, which is Greek or Latin or Hebrew, I don't care. For enough. Enough house? It meant when it was given that whoever had this place could want nothing else. They must have been easily satisfied in those days, I should think. Don't loiter, boy. She was of about my own age, but she seemed much older being a girl. And beautiful. And self-possessed. And she was as scornful of me as if she'd been one and twenty and a queen. Access to the house was by a side door, the great front entrance having two chains across it. Inside, the passages were all dark, and with only a candle lighting us, the girl led me up a large staircase, along more passages, finally stopping at the door of a room. 
Go in. After you, miss. Don't be ridiculous, boy. And she walked away, taking the candle with her. Come in. It was a dressing room, well lighted with wax candles. No glimpse of daylight anywhere. Then, at the draped, fine dressing table, her head leaning on her hand, was the strangest lady I have ever seen, or shall ever see. She was dressed in rich materials, satins and lace and silks, all of white, and she had a long white veil covering her hair. But her hair was white. Some bright jewels sparkled on her neck and hands, or lay glittering on the table. Then. I saw that everything that ought to be white had been white long ago, and had lost its luster and was faded and yellow. And the bride within the bridal dress had withered like the dress, and there was no brightness left except in her sunken eyes. Once I had been taken to one of our old marsh churches to see a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that had been dug out of a vault. Now that skeleton. Seemed to have dark eyes that moved and looked at me. Who is it? Pip, ma'am. Pip. Uncle, Mr. Pumblechook's boy, ma'am. Come to play. Let me look at you. Come. It was when I was close to her, avoiding those eyes, that I noticed her watch, and a clock in the room, had stopped at twenty minutes to nine. You are not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born. No. What do I touch now? Your heart, ma'am. Broken. I sometimes have sick fancies, and I have one now to see some play. There. There. Play. 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 Are you sullen and obstinate? No, ma'am. But I'm sorry, I can't play just now. If you complain of me, I shall get into trouble with my sister. So I would do it if I could. But but it's so new here and fine and sad. So new to him and old to me. Call Estella. You can do that at least. Call her at the door. Estella. Estella, Estella. Then at last Estella answered, and her light came along the dark passage like a star. Miss Havisham tried a jewel against her hair. Your own one day, my dear, and you will use it well. Let me see you play cards with this boy. He's common. Well, you can break his heart. What do you play, boy? Only beggar my neighbour, miss. Beggar him. During the games,、Ten. she sat corpse-like. Two jacks. He calls the knaves jacks. This boy, and he's got coarse hands and thick boots. I had never thought of being ashamed of my hands before. I dealt, and as was only natural when I knew she was lying in wait for me to do wrong. Misdealt. Stupid. She says many hard things of you, but you say nothing of her. What do you think of her? Tell me in my ear. I think she is very proud. And I think she is very pretty. Yes. She is very insulting. I want to go home. You shall soon. Play the game out. I played the game to an end with Estella, and she beggared me. When shall I have you here again? Today's Wednesday. I know nothing of days of the week. Come again after six days. You hear? Yes, ma'am. Estella, take him down. Let him have something to eat, and let him roam and look about him while he eats. Go, Pip. In bright daylight, I looked at my clumsy hands, 
Why had Joe never taught me jacks should be called knaves? Here's bread and meat. You're crying. I'm not. But when she'd gone, I leaned my sleeve against the wall and cried, and knocked the wall, twisting my hair. I was so humiliated. In a child's world, there is nothing so finely perceived, finely felt, as injustice. I had known from the time when I could first speak that my sister, in her capricious and violent government, was unjust to me, as was this girl now. Now continually walking away from me as I wandered in the overgrown garden and ate food, thrown at me like a dog in disgrace. Why don't you cry? I don't want to. You do. You've been crying till you're half blind, and you're near crying again now. <laughs> For the last time, what is she like? Despite having my face ignominiously shoved against the kitchen wall for not answering Mrs. Joe's questions fast enough, I felt convinced that if I described Miss Havisham as my eyes had seen her, she would not be understood, and that there was something coarse and treacherous in my dragging her as she really was to say nothing of Estella before the contemplation of my sister. Oh, Uncle Purple Choke! Boy, what like is Miss Havisham? <gasps> Very tall and dark. Is she, Uncle? Indeed, good. Oh, I wish you had him, Uncle. Always, you know so well how to deal with him. Now, boy, what was she doing of when you went in today? Sitting in a black velvet coat. <sighs> and Mrs. Stella, that's her niece, I think, handed her in cake and wine on a gold plate. Was there? Was anyone else there? Four dogs. Large or small? Huge. And they were fighting for veal cutlets out of a silver basket. Where was this coach in the name of Gracious? In Miss Havisham's room, but there weren't any horses to it. Can this be possible, Uncle? I tell you, Mum, my opinion is it's a sedan chair. She's flighty, you know, quite flighty enough to pass her days in a sedan chair. Did you ever see her in it, Uncle? Never clapped eyes on her. How could I, when I've been there, I've been took up the outside of a door and she spoke to me that way? What did you play at, boy? With flags. Flags? Estella waved a blue one, I had a red one, and Miss Havisham had one sprinkled all over with little gold stars. And then we all waved our swords and shouted. Well, where, where did you get the swords from? Out of a cupboard. And I saw pistols in it and jam and pills and... It was all lighted up with candles. That's true, ma'am. That is the state of the case. For that much I've seen myself. So occupied were they with my marvels that they saved me from mentioning the balloon in the yard and the bear in the brewery. And Joe coming in had to be told in detail everything by my sister. And they ate their meat off gold plates. <sighs> she must do something for him. I think property will be left. No, ma'am. Perhaps a handsome premium, binding him apprentice to some genteel trade. Say the corn and seed trade. Eh, hey, Sixpence? I'd say be lucky if Miss Eversham's give him one of those dogs which had fought for the veal cutlets. If a fool's head can't express better opinions than that, and you've got any work to do, you had better go and do it. Goes out. Uncle Bumblechute gone? Yes. What is it, Pip? You know all that about Miss Havisham. Oh, remember, I It thought... ain't true, Joe. It's lies, Joe. But not all of it. If there weren't no wheel cutlers, at least there was dogs. No, Joe. A puppy? Oh, what possessed you, Pip, old chap? There was a beautiful girl... And she was proud, and she said I was common, and I wish you hadn't taught me to call knees at cards Jack's Joe, and I wish my boots weren't so thick nor my hands. I don't know how the lies come. Lies is lies, Pip. That ain't the way to get out of being common, old chap. And as to being common, I don't make that out at all clear. You're uncommon small, yes, but likewise, you're an uncommon scholar. I'm backward, Joe. Why, see what a letter you wrote. 
You think too much of me, Joe. Be it so or be it so, you must be a common scholar before you can be an uncommon one, I should hope. The king upon his throne with the crown upon his head can't sit and read out the acts of parliament in print without having begun when he was an unpromoted prince with the alphabet, could he? No, Joe. Were there a flag, perhaps? No, Joe. Well, that's a thing that can't be looked into without putting your sister on the rampage. Now look here, Pip, as what is said to you by a true friend. If you can't get to be uncommon through going straight, you'll never get to do it with lies. You angry with me, Joe? No, old chap. But bearing in mind that them lies, which I mean to say were of a stunning and outdacious sort, alluding to them which bordered on wheel cutlass and dog fighting, a sincere well-wisher would advise Pip them being dropped into your meditation when you go upstairs to bed. That's all, old chap. Don't never do it no more. There was a public house in the village, and I had strict instructions from my sister that, after I'd been to Mrs. Wopsle's evening school and my long fight with Biddy and the alphabet was over, I should bring Joe home at my peril. Hello, Pip, old chap. There was a stranger sitting with Joe and Mr. Wopsle, a secret-looking man. His head was all on one side, one of his eyes half shut up, as if he were taking aim at someone with an invisible gun. As I sat, he nodded to me, then rubbed his leg in a very odd way. You were saying you was a blacksmith? Yes, I said it. <laughs> you didn't mention your name, by the by. Joe Gargery. What'll you drink, Mr. Gargery? Well, to tell you the truth, I ain't much in the habit of drinking at anybody's expense but my own. But once in a way, and on a Friday night too, can't put a name to it, Mr. Gargery. Rum. Three rums, my lord. This other gentleman, Mr. Wopsle, is a gentleman you'd like to hear give it out. He's our clerk at church. Ah, the lonely church. Right out in the marshes, with graves round it. That's it. I'm not acquainted with this country, gentlemen. But it seems solitary towards the river. Most marshes is solitary. No doubt, no doubt. Any uh, vagabonds, vagrants of any sort out there? No, none but a runaway convict now and then. And we don't find them easy, eh, Mr. Wopsle? <laughs> Seems you've been out after such. Once. Uh, Not that we wanted to take him, you understand. We went out as lookers-on, me and Mr. Wopsle here, and Pip also here. Didn't us, Pip? Yes, Joe. He's a likely young parcel of bones, that. What is it you call him? Pip. All this while, the strange man looked only at me and as if he were determined to have a shot at me at last and bring me down. But he said nothing until... Three rums and water, gentlemen. Then he made his shot. He stirred his rum and water pointedly at me. And he tasted his rum and water pointedly at me. And he stirred it, not with a spoon, but with a file. And when he had done, he wiped it and put it in his breast pocket. I knew it was Joe's file and I knew that he knew my convict. I sat gazing at him, spellbound. But he now took no further notice of me and talked about turnips for half an hour until it was time to go. Stop <coughs> off a moment, Mr. Gargery. I think I've got a bright new shilling somewhere in my pocket. And if I have, the boy shall have it. He looked it out from a handful of small change, folded it in some crumpled paper. Yours, mine. Your own. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, Blacksmith. And you, Mr. Whipsaw. Right. And he gave me only a look with his aiming eye. No, not a look, for he shut it up. But wonders may be done with an eye by hiding it. Joe went all the way home with his mouth wide open to rinse the rum out with as much air as possible. But I was in a manner stupefied by this turning up of my old misdeed and old acquaintance, and I could think of nothing else. A bad and I'll be bound, or he wouldn't have given it to the boy. Let's look at it. Oh. 
What? What's this? It's wrapped in two one-pound notes. Take them back! Joe caught up his hat again and ran to the jolly bargeman. But the stranger had left. And all Joe could do was to leave word concerning the mistake. And my sister sealed the notes in a piece of paper and hid them under some dried rose leaves in an ornamental teapot in the state parlour. There they remained, a nightmare to me, many and many a night and day. I couldn't sleep when I got to bed, through thinking of the strange man taking aim at me with his invisible gun, and of the guilty coarse and common thing it was to be on secret terms of conspiracy with convicts. I was haunted by the file. A dread possessed me, that when I least expected it, it would reappear. I coaxed myself to sleep by thinking of Miss Havisham's next Wednesday. But then, in my sleep, I saw the file coming at me out of a door, without seeing who held it. In episode one of Great Expectations, Pip was played by Gary King, Miss Havisham by Geraldine McEwen, and Estella by Polly Maberly. Jim Carter was Joe Gargery, and Maggie Steed, Mrs. Joe. Uncle Pumblechook was played by Norman Jones, and The Stranger by Fraser Carr. The narrator was Douglas Hodge. The music was composed by Malcolm Clark. Great Expectations was dramatised by Ray Jenkins, and directed by Sally Avons.